All right, folks, as we continue on Smile Jamaica, in order to find a cure for COVID-19, scientists have to spend extensive time studying the behavior of the virus. Now, Professor Dr. Upton Allen is one such researcher from the University of Toronto who will be working on treatment and vaccine. The doc is on Zoom to share um, what he's doing and maybe his expectations. Good morning, doc. Good morning. How, How are, are you, you, sir? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for... Um, joining us. So you're speaking with Neville. I'm Neville and Dwayne. You will hear from Dwayne in just a little while. Um, tell me before we start about your Jamaican connection, sir, please. Well, thank you. Well, I was born in St. Elizabeth, but I grew up in Portland, so I see myself as a Portlander. Um, I uh, spent my years, my early years actually, at Happy Grove, and then I finished up at Titchfield. Um, so I'm, I still have family in Portland. Um, family still lives in Boston, actually, home of uh, Jerk Pork. <laughs> <laughs> do you still come and visit us every now and again? I do, I do. Prior to COVID, I was uh, there very regularly. I would say at least a couple of times, sometimes even three times in one year. Fantastic. So I'm still very connected. Fantastic. I know you're here to talk to us about your research and what you're doing. Um, and, and, and I'm not trying to find any blame here, but how did this happen, sir? How did this happen? Was this human error? Was this something that leaked out of a lab? How, how, how did this happen? I'm an older fellow. I've never seen anything like this in my life. How did this come about? Well, you know, um, basically what you're looking at is the um, uh, movement of a virus that's in, that was in the animal kingdom, so to speak, and it crossed over into humans. And, uh, and essentially when that happens, what you have uh, is um, humans um, having absolutely no immunity to it. And that's why we call it a novel virus, meaning that our immune systems have never seen it before. And because our immune systems have never seen it before, it means that um, we have absolutely no defense against it. And that's why it's uh, been so devastating. Wow. In terms of um, the way forward, in terms of getting research done, I know you guys are looking at the SARS as the base to try and come up with vaccines for COVID-19. What's that process been like? Well, you know, the, um, there's several parts to that. First is um, uh, doing the testing in uh, animal studies. Um, we're not doing that particular area, but there are many uh, people around the world working in that. Um, and then after that, then you have um, uh, testing done in humans. And that involves uh, several phases. Um, and the phases actually um, can result in up to 12 to 18 months before one has a vaccine that is ready. That's, that's a pretty long 18 time. months yeah. before we could get a vaccine. 18 months from when? From now. You know, I would, from right I would say, now? Um, yes, from, from now. It's, uh, it's, it's going to take a while. But would the search, would not the search for vaccine, would, would, not, would not that have started from when we found out about this COVID-19? Yes, it, it's actually, um, you know, started even before that, because what they're able to do is actually um, uh, build on an infrastructure that was already in place. Um, and then, you know, once COVID came on, one sort of pivoted uh, to focus on COVID. But the actual process, uh, takes uh, yeah, quite a while to, to illustrate how how, it take, how long it takes. For example, there are really um, uh, four phases, um, and each phase uh, it involves um, uh, testing the vaccine in humans. And so the first phase would last about six months or so. You test in a small number of people. Then the second phase, another six months, a larger number of people, and the third phase, even more people another six months so you can see how it adds up and so it's um uh, it, when we talk about having a vaccine by the end of the year that's incredibly optimistic we we hope that happens but um we have to be prepared that it might not professor we're talking about vaccine so the vaccine and, and forgive my ignorance but the vaccine would ensure that we don't get it what about a cure is it the same thing we're talking about here uh they're related. They're, uh, when we talk about um, uh, a cure, we're, we're really talking about um, uh, two things. First um, is that if somebody gets infected, that you can actually treat them and cure them of their illness. So that's one thing. 
and that involves um, developing various medications to um, uh, treat the infection. And we don't have any effective medications as yet. The second aspect of that would be trying to prevent them from getting the infection in the first place. And that's where vaccines come in. Um, but it is, um, uh, it's incredibly important that um, uh, until vaccine becomes available, we have measures in place to try to prevent the spread of COVID. To, it is important though to, to bear one concept in mind and that is the, the idea of uh, herd immunity and that is um, the level of protection that we need to have in the community to prevent the sustained transmission of COVID. And for, for this particular illness, um, uh, COVID-19, the level of herd immunity is assumed to be about 65 to 70%. And we'd have to achieve that by either natural spread of infection within the community or perhaps um, vaccination. Where are we on that road? To, to illustrate the situation in Canada at the moment, the, the um, uh, prevalence of COVID in the highest hit provinces of Ontario and Quebec is about three to 6% we estimate. We need to get to 65 to 70% wow. to have adequate herd immunity. In wow. other words, we're pretty, at the moment, we're light years away. Wow. And illustrates the importance that we have to think of other measures before we get there. Wow. Yeah, you speak about other measures um, with treating COVID, coronavirus patients, and you have the antiviral agents and the immune, immunomodulators. Talk to me about the, the modulators. How does that help? Well, um, the, uh, the way that the immunomodulators work is that they um, seek to plug uh, holes in the body's immune defense against COVID, so to speak. And that's probably the simplistic way of looking at it. Uh, in other words, um, uh, if there are defects in the immune system, uh, the immunomodulators can adjust that. But, but there's another way that they can work, and that is um, uh, sometimes the immune system overreacts. And what one wants in trying to counter COVID, one wants a measured immune response, but sometimes what happens is that the immune system overshoots, it overreacts. Um, and, and so the immunomodulators dial that down. And so that's one of the areas that we're looking at in our research to try to determine the, the right balance of the immune system and the nature of the responses that are occurring so that we can appropriately titrate the treatment that we need through perhaps the use of our immunomodulators. Yeah. Professor, final question from me. I, I read, I think it was yesterday in New Zealand, that I think they said they haven't had a positive test in about a month. And I think the prime minister there was saying that they'll soon um, do away with social distancing. Here in Jamaica, I think we have done well. Unfortunately, we lost someone else. So we've had 10 deaths. Until we have a vaccine, and you hear about flattening the curve, can we be comfortable and says, well, all right, it, it look like we're good now. Can we do that? So, so that's a really great question. Now, the, the answer is no. The answer is that we really can't drop our guards. Uh, the bottom line is that until we have a vaccine, as, as I said to you, most places um, uh, you know, around the world, like in North America now, we are you know, way, we're just at the starting gate, so to speak. And the finish line is about 65 to 70%. So there's a long way to go. So with that in mind, we can't, we can't drop our guards. We still have to do the measures that um, the, the um, various public health experts tell us that we need, the social and physical distancing, using appropriate face coverings as, as needed. That's really uh, extremely important. It's also important to note, though, that um, as we reopen our societies, whichever jurisdiction you're in, whichever country it is, as we open our, uh, reopen our societies, we will start to see more cases, but that's not a reason to panic. We will see more cases. Um, what, what one wants is that those cases occur in a setting of a mound over time as opposed to a peak, because when you have these uh, massive peaks, then the healthcare system becomes overwhelmed. 
So one wants um, to spread the cases out over time, flattening the curve over time, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, Doc, from a scientific perspective, before we go, can this be prevented going forward? Another outbreak. It's going to be really important to continue the research to identify uh, opportunities for um, animal viruses to jump over into humans. So the research needs to, to continue. Um, we will have other threats, unfortunately. Um, uh, will we be able to prevent uh, something like this? Um, one, one hopes so, but uh, there are going to be challenges. It's something we have to be prepared um, to uh, deal with these um, battles when they do arise. Uh, but I hope that um, we never see anything like this for the next 100 years, but uh, it might well happen, and we just have to be prepared to deal with it. Well, Professor, so great to have you with us, sir. Thank you so much for uh, speaking with us, and hurry up and come back and come check us out. All right, sir? You still talk part Absolutely. one? You still, you still talk part one thing, sir? Yeah, man. Wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Stay safe, sir. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right, Professor Dr. Upton Allen. Um, all the way in Toronto. 10 minutes to your health. We'll do it again next Thursday.